Good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Alina Anissie. I am part of the innovation team at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, and it's my pleasure to moderate this session today. This webinar is jointly organized by ACER, the European Union Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators, and IRENA. We will be discussing about innovations in electricity market design for solar and wind integrations, lessons learned from Europe. This topic IRENA and ACER brings to you today is highly relevant to enable the integration of more renewable energy in our power systems. The deeper integration of the European uh, power market and the new regulations brought by the Clean Energy Package paved the way for a gradual transition away from the fossil fuels and towards a carbon neutral economy. In today's discussion, we will touch upon market design innovations that enable this transition and lessons learned and best practices from Europe that inspire other regions. But before I deep dive into the agenda for today, let me walk you briefly through a few housekeeping items. All of you are currently muted and will remain so throughout the event. There is a Q&A section and we invite you to post questions to our panelists there. We will be monitoring questions throughout the event and select a few. However, due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your question is not answered. We will uh, use all the questions to inform further discussions. You can also use the chat function to introduce yourself and let us know where you tune in from. The slides and recordings will be shared via email after the end of the webinar and they will also be posted on our uh, website. Uh, you may also take a look at the materials for further, further reading in the handout section. Uh, also, we encourage you to please tell us how we did to help us improve. Please fill in the survey that will be sent to you after the webinar. Uh, and now, I am pleased to welcome uh, to our speakers uh, today. Uh, Matthew Franson is Policy Officer at ACER, expert in European electricity market. And my colleague, Elena Ocenik, which is the IRENA expert working on country case studies within the innovation team. Interesting in the context of this webinar, it's also to mention that before joining IRENA, Elena worked at ACER on market monitoring. Uh, welcome both and thank you for joining me in today's discussion. On today's agenda, we have three presentations followed by Q&A session. I will first start with a very short setting the scene presentation, introducing our work at, uh, on innovation at IRENA. We will then hear from Elena, who will present an overview of innovations in electricity market design mapped in our uh, innovation landscape report that I will explain you just in a second. Matthew then will give us insights into the European electricity market, focusing on European electricity wholesale market functioning and the forward looking innovations discussed at the European level. So, without any further delay, let's move right to the scene setting part on innovation landscape report for a renewable power future. In the innovation team at IRENA, we have been mapping and analyzing the emerging innovations that allow the integration of variable renewable energy, such as solar and wind generation. These technologies are now cost competitive and due to the tremendous uh, decrease, uh, cost decrease over the last year, they are now cost competitive. The challenge is, however, to integrate this variable generation in current power system. So we have been mapping innovations that uh, emerge to, to help with the integration of variable renewable energy. And we observe that there are plenty of innovations in enabling technologies. We see battery storage emerging, electric vehicles, uh, hydrogen produced with electrolyzer, also called green hydrogen, and also a lot of digital technologies with new application in, in the sector. However, innovation goes beyond technology. We see innovative business models emerging, such as peer-to-peer -peer trading or aggregators. And we also see a lot of innovations in regulations and market design that incentivize a more flexible behavior of all actors in the market or empower consumers or different or regional market or different, different uh, innovations in regulations, just, just to name a few. Um, also, we see innovations in the operation of the system with emerging practices that value complementarities between renewable generation or innovations for operating an increasingly decentralized system. 
um, the synergies between all these innovations in all the dimensions are key to achieve a well-integrated renewable power system. This is what we call systemic innovation, and this is what is the main message of, of the report. Um, I, will, I want to go you through a little bit how the synergies between innovation in this dimension are playing out. Most of the times we see first uh, innovations in enabling technologies emergence, and this represents basically new opportunities to operate the system with batteries, with digital technologies. So we have, due to enabling technologies, we have innovation in system operation. But the question is how to monetize all this value created. And that's why we need to design new regulations to incentivize uh, these new investments. And this, we, then we have innovations in market design that basically creates new business cases a new business model to enable new revenue stream for the new technologies. However, it's also the case when uh, re innovation in, in regulations are sometimes lagging behind private sector identifying new business opportunities by themselves. So this is how a little bit this synergies between all these dimensions play out and how it's important to have a real on the ground solution to have to look uh, holistically at the innovation and to have innovation in all dimensions, all these four dimensions. Uh, we mapped at IRENA these innovations that we, we see more most relevant for the power uh, system transformation. And we come up with these 30 key innovations uh, for the integration of variable renewable energy in power system in all the four dimensions. They are all included in the main report, Innovation Landscape for a Renewable Power Future, which was la launched last year. And we also have uh, Okay, now I think it's fine. We also have um, published um, to complete the power sector innovation toolbooks for countries, a short brief for each of the 30 innovations. Each of, of, each of the briefs provide a short description explaining how these innovations, each of the innovations support the integration of the wind and solar and the status in terms of deployment and concrete examples on, on, of recent, re recent projects implemented all over across the globe. They are all available to download from free on IRENA website. Uh, so all these form a big toolbox that aims to support countries in considering new and innovative solutions to address their own challenges, transform their power sector centered around renewables. This is a lot of information. You find it all available online. But last uh, two weeks ago, we launched a digital a version of this toolbox of innovations that you can find on www.irena.org slash innovation slash toolbox. It is an interactive uh, content of all uh, of most of the content of the report and the brief. So please take a look and play around. It's quite intuitive and, and it's nice. We, we find it. Um, so just to conclude my setting the scene uh, with another key message from, from the main report, it's uh, to look a little bit on how the power sector transformation uh, looks like. And we see that under the big umbrella of decarbonization strategies, we see three main innovation trends. Decentralization with the deployment of distributed energy resources and that turns the consumer into an active participant. Then we see digitalization as a main trend with the applications of uh, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence in the energy sector and electrification in an effort to decarbonize the end use sectors with renewable electricity, like in transport uh, with electric vehicles, in heat industry with heat pumps, and, and so on. These are the main trends uh, for power sector transformation, and I will leave it here for the setting the scene. And now I am very pleased to welcome Elena, who will deep dive into the market design innovations and identified in the landscape report. Elena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Arina. Okay, okay. one second. I'm I will you the slide. So you can control now, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the introduction. Um, indeed, what I would like to do now is to walk you through the innovations in terms of market design. And there is another way that we can look at the 30 innovations that Arina just mentioned, and that's the following. We could look at them um, as being clustered around the four 
uh, key innovation dimensions, so enabling technologies, business models, system operation innovations, as well as market design. And there we clustered them into retail and wholesale market innovations. And this is where the focus of today's webinar lies. What we have done last year, we have looked together with the Swedish Energy Agency at how these innovations that we have identified in our project can help Sweden achieve its very ambitious policy target of 100% renewable power in their system in the next two decades. And as you can see here on the slide, the Swedish electricity, electricity products, production mix is already decarbonized. However, in the next couple of years, the key challenge lies in the fact that wind power will increase from approximately 10% today, fourfold in, uh, by 2040. So this comes with a couple of key challenges in terms of system operation. So we know that the annual average inertia is expected to decrease, which will pose issues in terms of power system stability, but also more generally in terms of balancing the demand and supply. Since there is greater consumption in the south, but there is significant um, hydropower generation in the north of the country. But also in the longer term, while a lot of investments are being planned to expand the network, the, both the distribution and the transmission infrastructure, this requires a lot of time to be, um, to be operational. So in the short and medium term, innovation will be needed. So what we did is we looked at the power sector value chain and we have identified four solutions that could help in that context. And what I would like to do now is I would like to walk you through the first and the second solution, which tackle specifically the challenges on the supply and the transmission side. Okay, now the first solution refers to the provision of innovative ancillary services, both from conventional, meaning hydropower, and variable renewable energy sources, meaning solar and wind. And as you can see here on this slide, for this solution to work, we actually need to combine innovations in three different dimensions. So we have on the one hand the enabling technologies, we have utility scale batteries, but also the digital technologies like Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, but also market design innovations uh, like increasing the time granularity in the existing electricity market and uh, also and innovative ancillary services. This, this goes also by the name of the solution, but also system operation innovations. And here specifically the advanced weather forecasting so that we can also forecast better the generation from solar and wind. And in the report that you can see on the right hand side of the slide, you will find examples both from Sweden, where a lot of pilot projects are, are being conducted, but also from international experience, in this case from Germany and the United States. In the second solution, which we have identified, um, we looked at the pan European electricity market as a flexibility provider for the Swedish system. And here we clustered um, and we combined innovations in two different dimensions. So here you can see on the one hand, the enabling technologies, all the digital technologies, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, but also blockchain, in addition to super grid, but more importantly, the market design innovations, as in the first solution, increasing time granularity, but also regional market. And not surprisingly, uh, we have a lot of examples from Europe, which we have looked at. Uh, but also from Denmark. I think this is an interesting example because Denmark is a very well-known um, uh, example of a country that has very high shares of variable renewable energy sources, over 50%. And this could be enabled, among others, thanks to super grids, the interconnections with the neighboring countries, but also thanks to the existent, uh, in, in, existent and well-functioning European electricity market. market. Now, let's have a look again. Um, but which exactly, what exactly are the innovations that we're speaking about? So when we discuss wholesale market innovations, here we refer to innovations that can help increase flexibility from the market participants, but also that can value um, the power, the, the power that is being supplied, but also that incentivize the provision of ancillary services. And on the retail market side, we speak about innovations that can um, that can uh, incentivize the flexibility on the consumer side, consumer and prosumer, that being said. However, 
the focus of today's webinar will lie on the wholesale market, um, on the wholesale market innovations. Okay. Now I would like to go one by one uh, through them. In terms of increasing the time granularity in electricity market, this is important because uh, through this innovation we can internalize the value of flexibility in the market price. Now, how can we do that? And there are two ways. On the one hand, we can reduce the market time units, meaning the duration of the dispatch, or we can reduce or end, uh, that being said, we can reduce the time span between the trading gate closure and the physical real-time delivery of power, meaning the lease time. And this has several benefits, both in the short term and in the longer term. So in the shorter term, we can improve uh, the flexibility in terms of system operation because we have more flexibility if we allow, for example, uh, the traders to trade up to 10, 15 minutes ahead of the physical delivery. But in the longer term, that's more interesting is that we can optimize investment in the flexible generation capacity because we will know through granular price signals where these investments are the most needed. And I would like to mention perhaps the key naming factors. We would need advanced computational power and optimization modeling software, but also an underlying efficient price formation in the first place in a market that functions well. And there are examples in, in various regions of the world, um, in Europe, that's for sure, in Brazil, but also in the United States. Um, what's interesting is also that in certain uh, European countries, and this started mainly in, in the Nordics, we see shorter lead times. So market participants can trade with each other uh, up to 30 minutes before the physical delivery. And in certain areas in Germany, this can be done up to five minutes. Okay, let's now move to the next one. In terms of increasing the space granularity in electricity market, here we don't really look at the underlying market design because both zonal and nodal pricing reflect grid congestion. However, increasing the space granularity is important in electricity markets because it can help reduce the redispatch costs and drive it to investments where these are mostly needed. And what's interesting here is that in the, in the longer term, if we have, so basically uh, reducing, sorry, increasing the space granularity means reducing the geographical scope of our market area. And in the longer term, this has a very important benefit um, in the sense that it can optimize the network and the generation capacity investments through the price signals. So more precisely, sorry, I think the slides just disappeared, but more precisely what happens is that renewable, variable renewable energy sources can actually uh, obtain the right price signals and developers will invest and develop solar and wind power plants where the prices are high because there is a business model behind that. On the other hand, if we look at the grid investments, this can also be incentivized by, by increasing the space granularity because then we would invest in the uh, between market areas where we see a very high price difference. Among the enabling factors, it's similar to the other innovation that I, that I mentioned before. Now let's have a look at some examples. We do have examples from the United States in Texas where there are more than 4,000 pricing nodes or New York with 11 zones. But interestingly enough, in Europe in general, each country border um, has been defined to be equal as well to the national transmission system um, operator zone. And the markets are usually equal to that. What's interesting is that in um, more and more cases, we see that um, there are countries that divide their national transmission system into more bidding zones, meaning market zones. And this is the case in Denmark uh, with two zones, but this is also the case in Italy with six, Norway five, and Sweden four. And only in exceptional cases, we can see like Ireland and Northern Ireland, Ireland where the market zone goes beyond the national borders. And this is important to note since this, this map, since this map was created, Germany and Austria are no longer part of the same bidding zone. Now, innovative ancillary services. These are vital services that support the power system operation. And we speak usually about frequency and non-frequency services, although there's not a widely definition, uh, recognized definition of all the various services available. 
However, what's really new here is the fact that we see more products being, um, uh, being designed, but also that new market participants are allowed to provide these services to the system operators. So for example, wind turbines can provide inertial response um, and solar, solar PV and, uh, and batteries can also provide voltage support. So more generally speaking, distributed energy resources can help to provide frequency and voltage um, control. So in terms of enabling factors, I think this is also uh, interesting to note. We would need to define performance-based uh, performance uh, uh, products, but also to separate the capacity and the energy products also to reduce the contracting periods because the shorter the contracting periods, the better for renewables. Um, also important to note is that the separation of upward and downward balancing products would help to integrate solar and wind because it can go in one direction and not necessarily in the other, unless it has, for example, uh, coupled a storage uh, system. And some snapshots, we have plenty of examples where uh, this is possible. We know that batteries can provide ancillary services in various European countries. Um, it's similar for wind power and the list can go on and on. Okay, let's have a look now at the at capacity markets. Here we speak about redesigning capacity markets. In some power systems, there is a need to have a mechanism like capacity markets to ensure generation adequacy and security of supply. So here we speak about this innovation in those cases where there is one. So basically, um, Basically, what is interesting or what is new here, why we speak about the redesign, is that on the supply side, there can be, again, new actors that can help provide flexibility and eventually reduce the need um, to have generation capacity. So VRE can participate, batteries can do the same, and so do interconnections, if they are considered in the, in the given mechanism. And at the same time, on the demand side, demand response could also be a factor that can play into this market. So that at the end of the day, uh, as you can see, um, uh, as you can see on this slide, eventually we have we have uh, we can address the supply shortage challenge. Okay, in terms of enabling factors, in order to unlock demand response and to unlock this flexibility, a key prerequisite refers to the deployment of advanced metering infrastructure, so smart meters and also an adoption of a clear methodology to define the capacity credit for the variable renewable energy resources. And there are, again, for a lot of examples that we have from the international experience, and I would like to quote at least one, in the single electricity market of Ireland and the UK, both interconnections, but also the renewable energy resources, as well as um, the demand response can participate in the capacity market. Okay, now I'm reaching um, the last innovation that I wanted to walk you through today. And this one refers to regional markets. Now, how does it work? Regional markets require, by definition, the harmonization of market rules so that electricity can be freely traded in response to market-based price signals. And the deeper the integration, the more rules uh, need to be harmonized. And based on international experience, we know that there are different stages of market integration. There are various benefits to have a regional market in place, which I would like to, to highlight at this point, because this will be the key of our discussion today. It can increase, regional markets can increase flexibility through extending the balancing area. So we can make actually use of, um, we can actually make use of the spatial complementarity of resources. So for example, there can be one country that has a lot of hydropower resources, while a neighboring country has pursued a strategy to develop a lot of wind energy. So by trading with each other, this is enabled. The system can make use of those, uh, of those complementarities. It can also help with generation planning and eventually lead to reduce system operation costs. Perhaps also important to note as, at this point is that there are some key enabling factors that need to be in place for this to function. And perhaps it's an obvious one, but physical interconnections need to be there for a market to, to function in the first place, as well as sufficient capacity made available for the, for the traders to actually trade and exchange electricity uh, with each other. A regional mindset can help 
uh, so do strong institutional arrangements as well as the governance model for such a market, as well as the robust IT system. And what I wanted to show you here on this, um, in this chart is that depending on the level of market integration, um, for example, if we have bilateral contracts only, or if we harmonize the market, um, uh, we harmonize the wholesale market, uh, we could even harmonize the auxiliary uh, market and perhaps even have a common capacity market. We can define that there are very that there are different stages of market integration. And from international experience, uh, we have provided examples uh, which you can find again in our briefs um, from Africa and Asia, for example, the Eastern African Power Pool up to the internal um, market in the European Union. And this is actually where our today's focus will lie. Uh, it's a very uh, it's a deep market. It's a it's, it's a market that's deeply integrated. And I'm very happy to, to learn and to discuss later on with um, Mathieu uh, about this. So, Arina, with this, thank you very much for your attention and uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Elena, for such a good overview and insightful presentation in the market design innovations that we identified as the most relevant one for solar and wind uh, integration in power system. Uh, you, you, you saw in uh, Elena's presentation this. Um, uh, covers. These are the covers of the innovation briefs for each of the innovation. Uh, again, a reminder, they are uh, available free of charge on our website. So if you want to uh, know more information and uh, on what Elena has presented today, uh, you can find it on the website. Uh, she, uh, because of uh, the focus of this discussion, she, focused, she covered the innovations in market design in the wholesale, uh, wholesale market. Uh, but it's important to emphasize that we also identified very important key innovations on the retail market for the power system transformation. But uh, let's go, let's, let's stay on the, on the wholesale market and especially on the regional markets. And let us hear from Matthew now some insights from Acer on the European electricity market. Matthew, I will give you control over the slides now and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Arina, Elena. Thank you for inviting me and organizing this uh, this webinar uh, today. It's quite impressive the amount of people that are attending. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy to uh, to be here. Um, let me see if I indeed ah yeah I I can start the presentation. As you can see, we recently got ourselves a new logo. So I'm I'm also pleased to be the one uh, well first showing this logo in our presentation as well our new digital identity and we have a new website uh, online which i will invite you to uh, to, to visit um, today i will talk you to through uh, a number of subjects uh, i will basically go through the EU, eu electricity wholesale market and the mmr key findings at a glance i'm 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 sorry i need to start a little bit with a disappointing message i will i will focus and show much of previous or last year's MMR. Um, the, the next MMR is is on the brink of being published. It will be it will be out next week. Uh, I will invite you, I will end with a with a link on the new the webinar of the new MMR being presented. But uh, if you listen well, I will provide you some uh, well some tips and some things from the new MMR uh, that are that are likely to come. So in this MMR, we'll look at efficient use of chromosomal capacity, the maximize, uh, maximizing available chromosomal capacity, and uh, how to deliver a security supply in a cost-efficient way. And then uh, on the final part of my speech, I will focus on, uh, um, on forward-looking market design innovations. So going into the MMR key findings at a glance, uh, I think in the recent years we've we focused on these three dimensions. So uh, the efficient use of available capacity, maximizing the amount of personal capacity, and ensuring security supply in a cost-efficient manner. Um, to start with the first, so generally the target is to have personal capa capacity used efficiently 100% of the time. Which basically means that that uh, capacity available on cross between zones is used in the right direction with respect to the 
uh, with respect to the, the market prices. And indeed, the current level is, is up to 87%. This is mainly in the day ahead time frame. And uh, well, the, the other time frames uh, uh, well, trailing that. I will show you a little bit more on that. The other uh, important part is the available cross over capacity in um, in, the, uh, in the in the European uh, market. There's recently been new legislation, and this new legislation requires uh, TSOs to offer 70% uh, of physical capacity towards the market. So allocation levels uh, need to go up. And of course, you understand if capacity available for commercial exchanges is increased, then uh, this would also mean that the markets are further integrated because price differences between markets uh, decrease. But this is currently not at par yet. Um, the level of, of cross on capacity is often below 20%. It is slowly increasing, and, and this is a key development in the coming years. And then as a final part, the, the security supply. Of course, we believe that the energy only market should be able to deliver uh, a secure uh, energy supply. Uh, but of course, we've always seen that, that, that there's an intention of member states to, to intervene and to ensure a security supply nationally. Uh, and this is also part of the clean energy package. Uh, and I'll show, so, show you something about this in, uh, in, in some slides later. Um, so then if we go into what is the current state of, of efficient use of personal capacity, uh, the implementation of day ahead and intraday market coupling is the most, uh, well, are the most prominent uh, aspects of, of this uh, using it efficiently. So market coupling is already spread across on day ahead level, spread across a large number of European countries. Um, I think I need to correct the picture a little because Croatia is, is coupled by now, but indeed the, the, the countries in orange and in purple to the right are, are still not coupled with the rest of Europe. And, and this is, I think, the final steps in the, in the integration project of they had markets in, in Europe, at least at the extent of, of, of they had uh, well, they had power exchanges. On intraday, uh, the development is even further. Uh, the orange and the blue parts you see here are the first and the second wave of, of cross-border intraday trade. Um, and so already now, um, well, all these countries can trade between them uh, on a continuous level on the day itself, uh, electricity uh, between the bidding zones of, of, of the, all these European countries, which is indeed already more countries than the single day have coupling currently. Uh, supplies. Um, and if you then look at what the numbers are, because uh, this, this, this calculation is done uh, consecutively each year, the, the level of day ahead has been fairly stable over the last year because no real well, structural extension has been done. Um, intraday is moving up. Uh, it is you know, more than 50 percent or probably even more already. Uh, and the balancing uh, is, is, is lagging. And I will say something more about this later on, on the European balancing platforms that, that are coming. Um, then on, on the efficient use of, of cross over capacity, an important uh, other uh, aspect, which is not an objective as such, but is that this market integration uh, contributes to price convergence. What you see here are the levels of price conversion in each of the the regional markets, the, the, the regional capacity calculations that are done in Europe. Um, and you can see that, that different aspects of this integration project have, have increased the uh, amounts of convergence significantly. Um, maybe to, to give some examples why things increase. Uh, well, for instance, in the, in the Baltic, there were new interconnectors uh, becoming operational and this, this increased the convergence between the countries in that region significantly. In 2015, the CWE region introduced flow-based market coupling. Um, and in, uh, in May 2014, for instance, um, Spain and, and France, or Spain and Portugal, uh, joined market coupling, which also increased their, their price convergence significantly. So, so these are things that, of course, well, you can see them when, when they happen. Although then later there's of course all the other ex exogenous uh, developments in the market which would be able to decrease it again. So it's something we follow uh, and, and it provides a fairly good 
a sign of how much uh, integrated a market is with the rest of Europe. Um, on intraday, we see similar developments, although shown in a different way. Here you can see the amounts of cross-border intraday uh, trade in the different intraday markets, and indeed slowly increasing um, uh, over time. And it's also something we've seen increasing in the, in the recent years uh, with the extra waves of, of cross-border intraday being introduced. Then on the maximization of wholesale uh, cross-owner capacity, um, the, the, this, this calculation um, is, is, has been a part of the electricity market for, for years. Uh, but with the introduction of the clean energy package, there was a, uh, a significant change. The, the change was that uh, there is now a requirement on TSOs to offer a minimum level of cross-owner capacity and this is also known as the 70% target. The 70% target being that 70% of the physical capacity of a line relevant for cross-border trade, of course, so usually the extreme high voltage, the extra high voltage uh, transmission lines are being offered uh, towards the market. And um, this, this so-called margin for available cross-border trade, as it's mentioned here, um, this, is, this is being monitored by ACER. So there was a recommendation last year, how should you calculate this? And in the beginning of this year, we started monitoring this, these, these availabilities. And uh, well, maybe sorry to say that the MMR will not include uh, the monitoring report on these margins. Uh, this will be published by the end of the year, but we then subsequently will uh, publish every half year a new report over the last half year, showing indeed uh, the amount of margin uh, the TSOs are currently offering. Um, maybe to sort of, uh, as, a, as in preparation of these, these reports, uh, showing you what the well the initial results are based on the data Acer had at the time. Uh, these were the the numbers included in the last market monitoring report over 2018, showing what well what what these margins actually look like. Um, to the left, you can see all the regions being uh, coordinated NTC sort of net transfer capacity calculations. Uh, and you can see that, that well, most of the regions that are fairly, well, fairly far away from offering 70%. So there's a significant uh, increase needed to, to, uh, to, come, to commit to these, uh, to these margins and to this level of capacity. On the right side, you see the current CWE region. In the CWE region, there is a uh, flow-based market coupling a mechanism which basically means that the, the available margin on any line is offered to the exchanges with some information so that the effect, the physical effect of a commercial exchange on a border is able to be allocated toward this, to this specific uh, cross-border line. And you can see the levels of each country being offered, seeing uh, indeed levels in Germany being fairly low, levels in Austria being fairly high. If you look at the average, they even make the 70% the, the almost. Um, and the other one being in between uh, uh, in, in terms of density graphs. So you can see how much hours of the year uh, uh, and the average level uh, that was offered. These are these are the figures we intend to publish in, in upcoming monitoring reports on this um, uh, on this subject. Um, then, uh, as a final slide on the MMR, the, um, the capacity mechanism. So, capacity mechanisms are being introduced in a number of countries. Uh, also, the clean energy package includes new rules about this. Uh, European adequacy assessment and, and common rules and decisions to be taken by ACER on a number of methodologies that, that serve indeed this, uh, this, 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 this harmonization, so-called harmonization, if you apply a CRM, then you should comply with certain uh, legal requirements coming from the, from the regulation. Um, what we see in Europe is that there is uh, that there are capacity mechanisms coming up uh, uh, in, in, in a large number of countries. Um, but the interesting part is, is that, uh, and this is the, the picture on the right, although those capacity mechanisms are being designed and being put in place, don't 
uh, seem to be aligned with an actual uh, adequacy uh, issue in in that same country, which is of course a, a part of a concern from our side. Is of course if you have a adequate ad real adequacy concern, a capacity mechanism could be uh, could be useful. But uh, having an adequacy having a CRM without an adequacy issue, of course, is something you would like to prevent because it would harm the development and the the, uh, the functioning of the electricity market. And then as a last point, so um, the, the, the benefits of, of all these changes. So on the left, you can see uh, the calculated benefits. We What we did in the, in the past on how much uh, would efficient trading, efficient market coupling lead in terms of welfare benefits. And you can see that uh, that the day at market would deliver a million, a billion benefit, uh, intraday market around 500 million, uh, and inter and balancing even more than 1 billion euro on a, on a European level. And seeing that in the day at market has been largely um, that this has been largely met, uh, but in the intraday market and balancing market, this is still a long way to go. But the same, if you see in development, this coordinated capacity calculation really being able to deliver much more. If you look at the 70% and the higher levels of cross on capacity to be offered, but also coordinated security of supply, spending a lot of money from, from the consumer in each of those countries on CRMs, Whereas if you have correct market functioning, this would this additional payment would not be necessary, at least not as a separate mechanism. Uh, and the same with bidding zone configuration. There's there's also huge expectations that a uh, correct bidding zone reconfiguration could lead to better functioning markets. Then I move, yes, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. Then I move to reflecting on some of the market design innovations. Um, uh, just checking <laughs> with Elena and Arina, you can still hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I get. A, I, I'm getting a message about using new hardware. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, going, going. Um, uh, yeah, time. So, time for energy in electricity markets. I think, from an Acer point of view. Um, a very important part, and it's both on the time grain and energy and on the space grain and energy, is aligning markets with physics. And what we, do we mean with aligning market with physics? Um, every time frame or every every possible time frame should uh, will ensure the relevant prices for that time frame. And this indeed means that the market time units. I think, as as Elena. I said before, market time units should be sufficiently short to be able to say, but if I deliver uh, electricity in this time unit, what is the price for that? Uh, and they need reducing uh, all the market times to basically 50 minutes as the as the current target is in, in Europe is, is indeed really important. But something we would add on that is this 50 minute is also the imbalance settlement period. And imbalance settlement really being sort of the the, the back door or the backstop to the market. If you don't deliver, uh, then then you'll pay balance charges. So a good functioning imbalance, a balancing energy market is also very much a a, a well a use a help in having functioning preceding forward markets. And this this single price, so this one time real time value of electricity is can then also serve as a scarcity indicator, and the scarcity indicator can then uh, back propagate towards uh, the forward markets and and ensure sufficient investment uh, in that. So this ensure back propagation is really a, an important part of increasing this uh, this um, uh, time granularity and aligning the markets with the with physics. Um, basically the same on the space granularity, same starting point, align the market with physics, um, and that the the prices then before they were reflecting the, the value of the electricity provided, now they should be able to reflect the scarcity of transmission. Uh, so in innovations there we see is that we move to flow-based allocations for forward day ahead and intraday markets, um, align biddings on borders with structural congestion because we consider this to be allowing 70% uh, 
uh, a physical capacity being offered to the market, and then indeed introduce intraday auctions at frequent intervals and recalculate the available capacity close to uh, close to real time. Um, another important part in 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 the space granularity part is you need to align. Uh, energy, electricity, and ancillary services balancing market with each other. The fact that bidding zones and, and the physical, the load frequency control areas or system operation zones uh, should, are not aligned always is an important part to make the incentives on the imbalance and the real time uh, uh, price signal to be aligned with the bidding zone is an important part. And then if you well, basically done all this, then residual conditions and the, the need for redispatch should uh, at least be minimized to a certain extent. And then uh, my final slide, because I think I'm running, well, I'm running close to my time limit. Um, so provision of innovative ancillary services. So this EU-wide optimization of energy and ancillary services is, a, is an important part of, of the next step. Uh, balancing market, balancing energy market being created on European platforms as a, as a first step, but also harmonizing and integrating dimensioning procurement and cross zone exchange of, of balancing capacity of the reserves being procured by TSOs is an important step. And then as a final part, yeah, this, the, the, the participation of REST, I've not really mentioned it ex this explicitly because we consider that creating a, a level playing field for all market participants also makes, well, means uh, creating a level playing field for REST and allowing them to enter these, uh, these markets as well. Um, I think that that was my last slide. I want to close with, with all uh, uh, highlighting that in a, uh, in a week, from now on the 28th, uh, or a week and a day, eight days from now, there will be a Acer's Chair joint webinar uh, presenting the key findings of the Net Monitor Market Monitoring Report. Uh, if you get these slides, you will find a link under this, this picture, and uh, you can register if you are interested to hear about the most recent developments. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, for sharing with us the developments on the integration of European markets. It was a very insightful presentation. Uh, Europe is clearly a front runner in this transition and the most complex and well integrated regional market so far we, we can see. So thank you very much for that. And let's jump to, to the Q&A session. I have to tell you, we are almost 500 uh, uh, participants on the line and we have received an overwhelming number of questions. Uh, so I try to, to go through them and to pick few, but apologize in advance for, for not covering all of them. We will try to pick it up on, on in the next yeah, webinars. Um, let's uh, reflect a little bit on uh, one key aspects that we want to also send a message with this uh, webinar it's we see that europe it's uh, it's quite successful in integrating uh, this regional market uh, being a front runner and we all look at, at europe as an example from all other regions so in your opinion maybe i can start with you matthew and then elena what are the key enablers of uh, the successful european electricity market integration uh, this is also very closely related to a, a question we have received. Someone is saying that uh, politics are often a uh, uh, burden. And uh, how is this, uh, how, how do you see also this aspect happening in Europe and what uh, advices and how do can be replicated outside for other regions that are trying to integrate? Yeah. I, I, I take your question as as how would indeed the political process work uh, in, a, in 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 regions which don't have these corporations yet, and how would they start, and how would they get get along basically? Um, if if I look back, so almost well, I think 13 years in this in this in this field, the the starting process of uh, the European integration was really. Uh, well, the, the intent of it was political. So uh, the, the member states, they, they supported the intention of integrating electricity markets in Europe. And this, this intent was, was first, of course, in communications and things like that and strategies, but then subsequently included in legislation. Although at the time it was really very general. It was just saying, let's integrate our markets basically. 
And this intent, uh, included in political statements, allowed the, the, the stakeholders or the, the parties responsible for that, regulators, TSOs, uh, exchanges at the time, to well sit together and think about how can we best do this and how can we indeed increase welfare for, for consumers by integrating these markets. So I think it was really a stepwise process because it started with the intent, reflecting on a political level, and then it uh, moved into first very high level legislation and then more and more into more detailed legislation along the way, because indeed there were, were concerns that it wouldn't happen in, in by itself, basically. So I think that this process of first, uh, well, uh, a voluntary cooperation is a very good example. If, if you have a political uh, intent, political support, then you can slowly move into this process of, of, of getting integrated. I hope this somewhat answers your, uh, your question. Yes, thank you. Except the political aspect, uh, any other uh, uh, key enablers that, uh, that uh, you can, we can send the message in yeah. to side of the words that you want to emphasize before going to to Elena's uh, com completion of the exam yeah I think I think maybe one one enabler I, I can remember uh, the the existence or the coming about of of exchanges has been very instrumental in European electricity markets so they had exchanges being there collecting bids and offers for market participants on a national level have been real instruments in the end of integrating together with the TSOs offering consumer capacity. So so that that those were starting points of, of integration as well. Thanks. Thank you, Madhu. Elena, yes, we have received a lot of questions also of how these innovations are in developed countries and uh, yeah, what uh, how what lessons learned from Europe can be replicated. Uh, you have done several studies on the country studies on the, the systemic approach on landscape and we would like to, to hear from you some of uh, your findings. Yes, thank you very much Alina and thank you also Matthew to, uh, for his reply um, to, to the first question. So for me if, if I look as an European working now, of course, with you now in an international context, I think there are a couple of, of, of lessons that one could draw and, and perhaps uh, try to use that in, in subsequent analysis. So for me, the political aspect is very important. I think this was clearly mentioned by Matthew, but there is another layer for me, and that's the economic one. Um, so the integration, for example, of the European market was uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago was rather, um, motivated by an economic uh, argument. It was the liberal, liberal, liberalization uh, before decarbonizing something. So I think the debate has shifted. Um, so the, the, and I think Matthew made this point quite clear that there are welfare, welfare benefits. There are gains for the consumers at the end of the day, which are important. So integrating markets for the, for the sake of integrating markets, of course, won't lead anyone very far away and policymakers would probably not really uh, go ahead if, if they don't see some form of benefit for their citizens for their for their countries so i think there's the second layer so the politics there's the economics behind it but i would say politics also in the sense of policies but also um, the necessary cooperation mechanisms and i think this is also um crystallized in the presentations we, we heard today um, and, and Matthew, I think, made that point also very clear, is that there are institutions, there are mechanisms, there are ways to cooperate, to enforce certain rules, to monitor. At the end of the day, also monitoring the market serves the purpose of improving the current legislation. So, and how do we do that? Basically, through, um, through providing evidence into policy making. So, this evidence also is quite important. And perhaps, Another element, which is maybe not an enabler, but one lesson, is that it, it is not happening overnight. It was a gradual process. And I think for other regions, for developing countries, um, or any other neighboring countries, pairs of countries that would like to, to increase the, 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 the trades where uh, infrastructure is available, uh, it can take time. But this leads me now to two more elements, and I would like to stop here because I know we have other questions, is the infrastructure. So investment in infrastructure to start with, uh, that's a key enabler in the first place when we speak about, uh, about markets. 
but also the role that uh, the private sector plays. So the private sector in the sense of it can be the power um, uh, exchanges, the market operators, but also how these collaborate eventually to, to, to make this wider, bigger policy goal um, happen. So I'd like to stop here and, and maybe pass it on back to you, uh, Alina. Thank you. Thank you very much. We see, we see uh, the numbers and also from ACER studies that uh, integrating uh, uh, the market in Europe uh, brings uh, tremendous benefits in terms of in the range of billions of euros to mm -hmm. European countries. And uh, I have a very interesting question here that uh, someone is asking, um, how can governments in North Africa, like Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, can actually benefit from all this uh, large European market that is uh, close to them? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, um, interesting, interesting question. Very good question as well. Um, maybe, maybe to sort of uh, reflect on this from a little bit, I, from from a close by. Of course, we're talking about the European Union and the member states in the European Union integrating in this market, but uh, we also have some leaving the European Union, uh, as we probably all know. Um, and indeed, uh, those countries are going for trade agreements with the European Union. And I think that indeed also electricity markets are part of those trade uh, agreements. And, and those trade agreements giving indeed the possibility of expanding uh, the European electricity market to other regions as well. Uh, and while I don't think uh, Morocco or North Africa are currently on the on the list of, of something like that happening soon, but the Bal the Western Balkan countries are definitely in that in that area via the energy community uh, cooperation. Um, of course, discussion with Switzerland have been ongoing for for years, and, and probably discussion with with the UK will will follow. So uh, I, I think that definitely. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the completion of the internal electricity market will probably not be the final step. Uh, it is very likely that indeed the focus would shift or would become also more on, on surrounding uh, countries uh, with which the European Union would have trade agreements and, and cooperation agreements with. Thank you. Elena, I know that you have uh, looked a little bit more in detail in the African countries and uh, any any lessons drawn from Morocco innovations or uh, that you can share with us? Yeah, I think topic? I could for a while now. I, I think there are two elements which I want to, to provide as a reply. So there's on the one hand, how can these countries benefit from the internal European markets? But I think it's also what they can provide to the market. Uh, or how you know what what can they uh, bring in exchange? And I think there's there are many things that can happen. And of course, this is not the topic of today's uh, conversation. But in terms of resources, these countries are um, blessed with abundant renew renewable resources. So solar is just one example, but we can speak about ocean energy, about wind, and so on. And this, we know that if we want to achieve the climate agreement, if we want to stick to the Paris Agreement. And if we're serious about this, we need to increase the share of installed electricity, renewable electricity generation, and massively and fast. So one way to do that is, of course, if we don't have the natural resources, for example, in a Northern European country, would be to trade with neighboring countries. And neighboring countries, if we define the market, as Matthew said, beyond the European Union, the energy community, and even across the Mediterranean, well, then, then the whole picture can change. So there are interconnections, for example, between Morocco and Spain today, and there are plans to, to, to expand that. Today, they don't participate in the internal European market. They only have, if I'm not mistaken, bilateral contracts. Um, so this can be improved, right? We're saying there are different levels of market integration. So we can see trade happening there. I also mentioned, um, uh, I didn't mention hydrogen yet, but Morocco is potential, and these are some of the European countries that we see in their national strategies, they are looking to import renewables in the form of other fuels, in the form of green uh, hydrogen, uh, but perhaps even other derived fuels. So again, um, I think there are many ways in which uh, in which the countries across you know across borders can can help each other, can trade with each other. Can, can benefit, but also um, uh, you know, learn from each other. So I would like to, to, to leave it here. Um, 
unless unless uh, maybe Matthew wants to react or if not big for you um Adina thanks thank you both well we are very close to to the time allot allotted to this uh, webinar but I would like to take a little bit more time like five minutes or so if uh, anyone wants to be connected because we have received so many interesting questions and I think it's worth to, to postpone a little bit the end of the webinar just to have the chance to, to question a few more. And let's deep dive a little bit more in the technicalities and how the ele uh, electricity market in Europe works and it's evolving. We have received some questions and I'd like to, to answer these questions mostly in the view of how it benefits on the integration of renewables. So uh, what role do you think real-time markets and scarcity price prices play in uh, in the future and of course on, on in the decarbonized electricity markets and how it can help renewable integration and also you mentioned this 70 percent uh, rule that from the clean energy package for the congestion and the, the transmission rights between countries so i'd like to understand how aligning this uh, physical congestion with market setup it's important to ensure proper market functioning and if it has a direct impact on the renewable integration this is from Martin. <laughs> yeah thank you thank you yeah so so on this on this real-time market this has been uh part of the debate for 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 some time um i think that the, what what generally the the idea behind it is is electricity or they're all forward markets, basically. In the end, we consume electricity now, like we do it now, and it needs to be generated at the time that we, where we use it. Um, and also, the intention there is really to integrate renewables in this market. So not that they, they are, well, sort of basically running on subsidy, they're running on market prices, those market prices really reflect the need, there is a there's somebody consuming it. There's somebody maybe even changing its consumption because there's a renewable generation at the time. So so those supply and demand conditions and and well creating the equilibrium between them is an important part of getting a functioning market and also getting a market that is indeed remunerating those renewables instead of a subsidy renew uh, uh, doing that. Um, and then and then indeed this this real time market this real time market price is of course the end it, it it is the moment where really the delivery should be done um a customer consuming and a generator generating and if they're not there then basically they they well what somebody else needs to solve it and there comes a cost with that this creation of a single imbalance but balancing energy price is an important market indicator and really showing the need for flexible generation as well so uh, apart from renewables being able to steer their output depending on what the demand is also storage and other new solutions which are indeed ramping up or trading close to real time could really help the system decarbonize so we don't think that that really pushing or well, pushing the renewables into the market is is to the detriment of them we think we actually think that it's to their benefit because in the end there would it would be well it, it would create new possibilities new services either to the tso's or to other market participants to indeed balance the system as a whole and, and be able to decarbonize uh, the demand That was on the real-time price. Do you want me to go on the 70% as well? Or Elena, first, do you want to go first? No, I, I think this is something that is part of your presentation. <laughs> okay, so no, so and uh, yeah, on the 70%. Um, yeah, that, that's it's it's a difficult discussion. It's of course related to the whole bidding zone discussion and indeed the, the space granularity. And the bidding zone discussion is really about how small should the space granularity be basically in a renewable energy system um our, our our starting premises is that that it's that it's about structural congestion so it's not an incident but it it happened structurally on a certain place if you would allocate the capacity because that's actually where the scarcity is for the market if you allocate that capacity to the market let all the market participants compete for that capacity for that scarcity and indeed their willingness to pay would be reflected in prices on both sides and in the price difference which is the the value of transmission it, it would be allocated 
in a most the most efficient way. If you then improve that with flow based, it would even even be better because it would only not only be bilateral but also on transit flows would be taken into account. So this this space granularity is is really important in getting markets to function. Then the seventy percent we think that 70% is not a unviable level. Um, I think the Nordics and other countries have shown that if you have sufficiently small or uh, 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 well, equally sized is probably the better word, equally sized regions, then indeed these levels could be met. The Nordic meets these, these levels of 70%. And then, and then once you offer them, then everybody has access to them in an equal way instead of uh, the access being unequally or well, discriminating between internal and cross-level exchanges. So, and this equality again improves the functioning of these markets. Thank you very much. A lot happening on the wholesale market. I will continue with two more questions and then we stop. But uh, let's, it's a very interesting one here that I'm seeing uh, maybe uh, for Elena. Um, Local flexibility markets. We see emerging in the decentralized uh, system a lot of uh, uh, yeah flexibility opportunities from the distribution distribution uh, distributed energy resources and the creation of this so-called local flexibility market. Uh, in Germany, there has been some pilot projects, and not only as uh, as we have seen how this plays out with uh, uh, the full regional market and the integration of uh, all this market at the wholesale level with the, with the small initiative on at the local level. Thank you. It's not, a, it's not an easy question to reply to, so I will also pass the ball uh, to, to Matti afterwards. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, seriously, uh, this is a very interesting question. So that's true. We see a lot of uh, flexibility markets being tested, popping up here and there. So this is indeed part of the, of the work we're doing. We're trying to, to, to see what is happening in this sphere as well. And today we really didn't really focus on that, but when we speak about retail market, uh, retail market innovation and we speak about uh, the integration into today's market of the distributed energy resources, then this discussion is really relevant. Um, from, from what I know so far, in Germany and in the UK, we see most of the pilot projects. And they're very interesting because what I find is that, again, remember we have the enabling technologies. So, of course, we have the generation, power generation technology. So, we have solar, wind, and so on. But we have the enabling technologies, AI, we have IoT, blockchain, and so on. And then we have the remaining of the innovation, market design, system operation, and so on. And what's interesting with the local flexibility markets is that a lot of IT companies provide this, their services. They create a platform, they bundle. So, here we're speaking more about digital innovation. They bundle all the, they map and they bundle all the services that distributed energy resources can do. And they're very interesting projects I've seen where they really use geospatial data. They map um, the solar PV power plants on rooftops. They map in addition all the transformers in a city. They, you know, they, they, they lay out all the network and so on. And having all these layers one after each other, then they have a conversation with the DSOs, with the distribution system operators, and they start running auctions. So pilots are being developed. Now, which model will eventually work? How does this exactly function with the TSO-DSO cooperation? We also know that there are a couple of pilot projects, uh, some research projects also being conducted at the European level uh, between countries um, as far as Sweden and, and Spain cooperating together on these issues. So we see this emerging. How eventually will play out in terms of regulation? I can't answer at this point, um, but but it will be important, especially to aggregate all those resources, to use all the algorithms we can, we can use to provide uh, services to the DSO so that eventually we, we have, so that eventually we have the need, less need to invest into distribution system um, uh, network expansion and perhaps even have less, uh, less ca capacity, I mean, less, uh, less, less capacity reserves. There are many implications afterwards, but again, I would like to also hear uh, Matthew's view on this, if he has one, because of course we speak about the big established markets, continental level, and now smaller local markets emerging. Yeah, maybe maybe to say something, you briefly touched upon those services and all those those products that that, that can be delivered. 
what I, um, I I think those those products like voltage or inertia or or congestion management or whatever you you name it are products that have been there uh, to a certain extent. Of course, voltage was usually solved in a different way. And then you see now that there's distributed generation and they can deliver this voltage support. What I find in the in the debate, and especially the term flexibility, I, I think I agree that flexibility in the system is needed. There, sh there should be response to, to generation imbalances and things like that. But, but the term flexibility as a product it's sort of confusing what it's actually about. We we can really see that if we talk, we say, is it voltage you need? Is it congestion you need? Is it inertia you need? It's much more clear who can deliver it. Whereas if you say it's flexibility, everybody says yes, but nobody knows what it actually is. And and I think that in a regulatory framework, it's always very important to to be very clear what you're talking about. Um, and I see that, 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 that the term flexibility is, is used by a lot of people. And then you ask them, what, what are, are you talking about A or B? Then they're not there yet. And if you want to really develop a market in the end, you need to define the product, you need to find the remuneration rules, the technical qualities, et cetera. So you can't, well, well, you can't get there with the term flexibility only. You need more than you need more than that, but I think that in the end, um, regulations in that respect will start to develop nationally first. Um, I don't think TSOs in the end will be happy with a flexibility project just by that. They will need to define it, and it will probably happen first nationally, and and I assume also on a European level. Yes, indeed, it's a, a very used overused term flexibility and not we, we don't fully understand it, or, or each of us understands something else maybe with flexibility exactly, that's but <laughs> let's uh, okay let's keep this for for another discussion we we are 10 minutes late already i want to ask maybe a last question that maybe elena can answer very quickly it's uh, an interesting one so i cannot miss it Someone is asking, uh, if I'd like my country to apply IRENA's toolbox for flexibility, again, what is that? Uh, what should we do to get such a support? Yes, okay, very interesting. Thank you, Alina. Um, indeed, at, at IRENA, we support government. So uh, what we are doing, we're working on specific topics, which our uh, constituency, our um, assembly has, uh, has endorsed and has uh, put forward for us in the work plan. And um, this is part, uh, this is part, or this is the context in which we have developed uh, the innovation uh, landscape project. Um, now, the applications, and this is where my my work comes in, um, refers mainly to applications that have been requested by specific countries. So I mentioned Sweden. I mentioned briefly um, Africa. So I've been working also on five African countries. Um, and this is every time a request that comes from government. So uh, let's say um, if, if a country is interested to learn more, to see how this is being, being applied, if, if there are innovations which can help tackle some of the challenges faced in the system, if it's more on the consumer side, perhaps on the supply side and so on, uh, IRENA can work with the, with the stakeholders in the country, with the relevant ministries, with the relevant uh, authorities. Uh, but the request as always would need to come uh, directly from, from um, uh, the governments. Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you both our speakers once again for the captivating presentations and very, very insightful discussion. Um, I would like also to, have, to thank the audience for having asked plenty of highly relevant questions to which our speaker has provided uh, very provocative and uh, interesting insights. Uh, now let's, uh, let's close this, uh, this webinar. Allow, allow me to do some final announcements. Um, this uh, Thursday, uh, on 22nd of October, we have a, a virtual event organized in partnership with uh, Benelux uh, Transport and Environment and Charge Point. It's about the future of heavy-duty vehicles in the pentalateral region, integrating electromobility in the energy transition. There is still time to register for it. Please uh, join us if uh, interested. Uh, and next week, on Thursday, we have um, a technical webinar uh, transforming seeds power systems to variable renewable energy in the Pacific. Also, there is uh, more time to, to register for this one, the link below. 
And uh, last but not least, Acer is having uh, the market monitoring report webinar next Wednesday that uh, Matthew already mentioned to you. I also put the link here for, for you to register to it. Yeah. Um, I, so I, I'd like Maybe Arena, I just saw that that my colleague was was mentioning in the chat that that the the report's already published tomorrow. So you can already go to our website tomorrow to read it. So great. We go to the website tomorrow and on next Wednesday we connect for more insights and maybe answer to some of the questions that uh, were unanswered today. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that is all from us today. Once again, thank you very much for joining and uh, see you online <laughs> next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.